Hey, what's up guys? It's Eli Knight, of course. I'm here with my friend Jared Jessup that I don't get to see as much anymore because I live in North Carolina and he is here in Benton, Illinois at IQ Jiu Jitsu. I'm visiting today. He was nice enough to allow me to do a seminar here, so I had a lot of fun. I hope everybody else did too. But we were talking about some different concepts as we often do whenever we get together and get to train and a video I've been wanting to make for a long time. Finally get together with a man that I thought would be the best to make it with is talking about crashing the distance. So from a self-defense context, we're looking at how do we go from this long range distance and they want to collect it or maybe I want to collapse it to get to a range that I feel more comfortable in and how can safely do that depending on the kind of energy the kind of strike the kind of whatever consideration so that's kind of what we're looking at today so we're going to discuss a few different types we're looking at haymakers straight punches rounding looping punches all kinds of things that you would typically see in a kind of street fight scenario. I think one of the first ones to probably start with is that big looping haymaker. I think that if we're here and I'm like pissed off at Jared and I just wanna knock him out, I'm probably gonna do this big looping haymaker. So um, that's kind of the context you're gonna take it as. First of all, I have to manage the space. I don't always get the luxury of being able to dictate this range right here, but this range is gonna determine what my reactionary gap time is gonna be. And that's huge because like to be able to see the attack coming and be able to visually process that along with tactile processing, that's a big consideration. So practicing from this range is, is really important if you do have that luxury. So um, when I see that, I notice, I can see like his, his feet peripherally, I can see his shoulders, his hips, all of his alignment. So I can kind of read the energy a little bit here. So whenever he cocks that punch and he goes to rear back, I'm gonna cover on that side here like this. And I wanna reach in, step in to kind of meet his, his, uh, uh, his distance here. Because if I allow him to come 100% and then try to defend, I'm still getting rocked here. If I try to go 100% to him, he's gonna rock me on the way inside. So the answer then is trying to crash that distance. And whether it's 50, 50, 70, 30, whatever, as long as I take some of the, the length off of that range that he wants optimally, then I'm doing a pretty good job. So from this position here, as he starts to come in, I lunge in as well, here like this. I'm covering and I'm trying to hook around his waist and I'm gonna kind of shuffle step and get around to the outside. Once we get here to the outside like this, then I want to keep my head in the center here so I'm not eating any elbows. I'm kind of low toward the middle of his back. I'm making either S or gable grip around his waist, keeping my elbows down and locked inside. And I've got this rear clinch kind of established here. From here, there's lots of different types of dumps, throws, trips, everything else that we can look to do. So, I, and then I can decide whether I need to follow him to the ground and finish the fight on the ground, or if I can throw him decently and then disconnect from the situation because the context dictates it's a better thing to disengage from. One of the things you want to pay attention to with this haymaker type strike, um, one of the indicators that he's throwing a haymaker that, that the, uh, is the distance. And the way he has to position himself to be able to throw the strike effectively, so he has to get that power arm uh, ready to use. So it's like if he's running up, there's going to be like a hop, hop, and then a swing, right? And that's, that body position you see is very natural. So what someone has to do to be able to swing that, that arm all the way over, right? Now, it could be the case that they're not just throwing a, a standard uh, uh, right, uh, right-handed right haymaker, but you run into someone who's southpaw or whatnot, or they, so they decide that their power arm is the left arm, right? And so uh, that can be uh, less common, but it's still very common. So if he decides to throw a haymaker with the left-hand side, I'm gonna step in here and come all the way through right here, okay? So <clears throat> notice my lead foot steps behind. It's the same shot essentially as the other one. So we're not we're gonna confuse having a bunch of different shots. But my lead foot's gonna go behind and my arm goes in front to help protect from the strike. I'm gonna find this far side knee. Now, as I step in, I'm gonna catch at the hip, kind of right in his knee. So my center goes underneath his, allowing me to uproot him and toss him right over my back. So he comes in, I see it coming up, I go boom, right here, and I'm ready to toss right here, okay, to finish whatever uh, way I see fit. Jared doesn't even have to do like a lot of lifting on this one, which is a cool thing because I'm kind of, it's like I'm walking into a turnstile that doesn't rotate and I'm just kind of hitting there because I've already programmed the coordinates. Whenever I decide I'm gonna throw a haymaker at his face, I've programmed the coordinates, this fist is gonna land right there. When he moves the target, it discombobulates me a little bit and I'm programming it for where his head currently is, not for where it's likely gonna be. So when I'm here and I'm gonna throw this punch, he comes in, his head's already covered some, so I've already missed my trajectory. His hips down here by my knee and it bunches my legs up because he disrupted my pattern going forward. And now I'm all screwed up and I'm probably likely to fall just like I did a while ago. We just looked at if the distance is further, right? That's where that kind of the haymaker type, that, that hop, hop swing comes in. It's very common. But a lot of altercations don't start from that type distance. They start from a little bit closer distance. Yeah, right here. What we don't want is this, right? Because <laughs> now he's blind to the sucker punch. Very stupid. 
whenever I'm here, and this may be a de-escalation de kind of thing. Let's swap sides for a second. When, if I'm here, then obviously if this guy's getting really aggressive with me, whatever the context was that, that created the situation, de-escalation is usually a pretty good idea. Now, I can still be blading my posture. I can still be tucking my chin. I can still be taking a pretty good defensive posture while still appearing as if I want to de-escalate. What does that do? And if I can settle it down, great. But if not, then I at least still am here to, when, if he does want to swing on me this way to be able to crash the distance. And again, I don't have to make him miss by a mile, just have to make him miss by like an inch. So if we, he's here like this and I can tell his shoulders start to come back and I crash that distance and I put this helmet on like this to eat any kind of like little glancing shots, then I'm going to be pretty safe. I got to protect the central processing unit here. So I'm stabilizing here like this. I'm creating these two kind of frames like this. And that's what's going to make impact on the center mass. Because from here, it, especially if he's bladed here and then whenever he turns, he's going to give me that open target between his two arms. Now, once I make that connection, I feel like it's kind of like a slap on bracelet. It's like here. And then once I make the connection, it wraps around. Mm -hmm. So I go like bang here like this. And then I'm going to take a step. And now I'm in here on that type of clinch. Now, it's possible that we can wind up in some kind of weird other orientation. But typically, if I go there and he's swinging on this high line toward my head, I'm going to have the opportunity to get those double unders. Once I establish those double unders here like this on off of this sucker punch kind of thing here, and I get to this position. Now I've got this connection made over here kind of by his floating rib. My head is kind of under him here under his chin because it's helping take his spine out of alignment, affecting his structure and balance. And then from here, we've got a pretty good open kind of stance, but my shoulder is nice and high. So if I eat any more like secondary tertiary shots. Might be if, if the person's um, around your size or a little bit smaller, then the elbow ends up landing a little bit over their arm. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to, to, to switch sides, mm -hmm. <laughs> so if he's going to sweep and I cover it here and he, we end up like this, I'm going to come down to the outside, put my ear on his shoulder and cup the, the elbow. Now we're in a uh, kind of a 50 50 year old over under type of clinch right here. And arm comes up and all the way over. Now there's a tendency here to reach. And so I'm, uh, I want to, if I'm trying, I want to make sure I'm not going uh, like this. This is a lot of extra movement and he can rip away. It's just up and then straight back down. I'll put my ear and then uh, we're in this nice, uh, clinch right here. The great thing about this over under clinch is that this hand, if this were my dominant hand because I threw it, so it probably likely is, once Jared makes that connection, what's so powerful about this, he's not just wrapping his arm around mine like a guillotine choke on my arm. He's making two points of connection, so he's got essentially a two on one with just one arm. He's holding behind my tricep tendon here like this but above my elbow, and he's pinching my wrist under his arm. So for me to try to get that arm back is not happening. Even if I were bigger and stronger than he is, then me trying to pull that arm out, I may even move him a little bit, but I'm not getting my arm back anytime soon. As far as my free arm over here that's not being connected, for me to be able to throw any decent shots, this is very awkward. And look how I'm opening my arm and he's taking advantage of that open space in my armpit here and is tilting my shoulders and throwing me off balance. That's what's going to subsequently help to him to set up a lot of his throws or takedowns if he employs those. Now it might be that, that you walk, walk up and the, per, the person got their hands up and whatnot and you're able to get some type of connection right here. So I, I haven't been able to, maybe I'm not crashing in, but, but we're in this space and we're kind of in this dancing area. Uh, I don't want to just let the hands fly. So I'm going to reach out and connect when I cup. I cup around the, the pads right here. Now if he moves forward, right, it's going to go into my forearms. And if he goes to pull the, uh, pull the arms back, I'm going to use that. I turn the thumbs down and rotate outward to take his arm to a position where it's weak to punch me, but allowing me to come in and get my clinch right away. Who's just gonna sit there with their hands up, ready to punch you in the face and just let you walk up and grab their hands? The answer, I just saw a video the other day that happened. I've seen a lot of videos where that happened because again, I'm gonna be trying to de-escalate. Jared's ready, he thinks he's ready to fight. So he's got his dukes up here like this, he's ready to punch me, he's a bad guy. And I'm like, dude, just calm down, just relax a little bit here. And before you know it, I've already, if not made the connection, I'm within range to be able to make that connection pretty soon. He starts to go back and that's gonna help pull me into that clinch. So he essentially helps me because I do this. And you see this all the time in MMA. You'll see guys that are actually around here and they're actually like putting their hands on each other's hands here. And before you know it, they're using that to close that distance. Same thing can work in this kind of de-escalation situation as well. The key for you training is making sure that there's a stickiness, a tackiness to your hands. So when they go on top, they're, uh, they're connected. Now that could also come up, say I've already shot in here and the guy's trying to just hold me at arm's length to beat me. Yeah, he's just posting, yeah, I'm going to beat me right here. If I just reach and try to grab it, I get beaten up. So I can't let that happen. So from here, as he goes to push, I'm going to immediately go and connect with that same stickiness, that same tactfulness between the elbow and shoulder, middle finger and thumb right on the tricep. So now for him to punch me, he has to pull an arm back. I'm going to 
I'm going to use that arm to roll around the posting other arm to be able to get all the way in to the clinch, right? Whichever direction. Yeah, that stickiness here like that is so awkward for me because I want to rip away, but if he's making that, that good tactile sensitivity, then he's going to be able to follow that kind of energy. And I'm actually helping him clinch and, and close that distance with me. So that's kind of interesting. Now, as a corollary to that, if you don't necessarily feel confident in your ability to kind of adhere like that or whatever, and you want to use something as a similar vein, this is almost a preemptive tactic. So we're here like this. I'm trying to de-escalate. He's got his dukes up already here like this. And I want to close in in an effective way. I can go here and I can just part the waves here like this and I can kind of scoop to the, in, the uh, scoop the hands apart so I can go to the inside and I don't have to worry about running into these two barriers. So essentially what that's going to look like is I'm going to go here, boom, this way. So you notice he's going to immediately start to react by trying to pull that away and it pulls me into the place here. Now, I'm also in a little like secret mm -hmm. hidden kind of technique. I want my head to kind of lead the way so that I'm kind of nailing him boom, with my head as I come inside. So I get a free hit off of it. It'd be really cool that that knocked him out and ended the whole thing. But even if it doesn't, then once we get here, boom, this way, I can get my clinch all the way back into the inside, where there's uh, probably double unders on that, but it might be over under too. Now, the reason this is such an essential set of clinches uh, to know is because we've covered the major areas that you're likely gonna run into. How you get behind the guy, how you go over the arm, how you go under the arm, how you shoot in low, right? How you just a direct shot, how you get sticky and connected to get all the way in. And you need each one of those to have an effective clinching system. So by understanding and kind of like knowing the range, seeing this, having really good de-escalation skills before any of this, uh, being able to preemptively like avoid situations like this, obviously. Situational awareness, all those things, that's the best thing. But being able to kind of read situations, being able to kind of read energies and reading uh, kind of intentions on this guy that he's showing me beforehand. So all those skills are necessary. This is one specific range of the fight though. This is one specific instance and moment in time where we've decided that the best course of action here is because of his forward heavy aggression, is for me to safely get myself into this clinch range where he no longer has the good trajectory or velocity to really land hard shots. Now, of course, this is a separate conversation from employing of weapons considerations and all that stuff. So there's lots of other things. This is one uh, piece of a larger framework that you kind of need for the holistic approach to any kind of self-defense situation. So hopefully this is helpful, guys. Um, let me know if there's any uh, things that you'd like to see us kind of break down a little further in the comment section. Uh, I'm sure that there's plenty of things that you have questions about, curiosities. We didn't go over a lot of takedowns and things like that, but there's lots of other videos that um, either Jared and I together or separately have put out, and there's lots of other things on my channel. So I appreciate you watching, and uh, thank you. Hopefully this was helpful. Appreciate you, Jared. Love you, brother. And keep watching Night Jiu-Jitsu channel, and check out Jared Jessup at, at IQ Jiu-Jitsu in Illinois if you're ever up here.